Bring all your failures. Bring all your failures. Bring your addictions. Come lay them down at the foot of the cross. Jesus is waiting there with open arms. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated for just a moment. Isn't it great to be in God's house worshiping together today on this wonderful Easter morning? We are so excited that you're here with us. I know we have some guests with us here today. If you are one of our guests this morning, if you wouldn't mind in the seat back in front of you, there's a communication card. If you would take that and fill that out and just give us a little information about you, we'd love to get to know you a little bit better. And you can place that card in one of the wooden boxes on your way out today. Also, on that card, uh, there's a lot of places for all of us to communicate together. There's prayer requests. If there's a, a special need that you have you'd like for us to be praying with you about, you can mark that. But also today, if God speaks to your heart through this service and there's a decision that you're needing to make for him, there's a place on that card that you can make that decision for him. And we'd be glad to get uh, information to you about that. You know, it was a little over a year ago uh, that our world kind of changed. Everything became different. And it's hard to believe that this time last year they were saying you couldn't gather together for Easter service. And ever since then, a lot of things became different. And as I said, our world began to change in ways I never dreamed that they would change. But there's one thing that has not changed. And that is the wonderful love that our God has for us. That while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. For God so loved the world that he gave us his one and only son. And we gather today not because we have a Savior that's still in a tomb, but we gather today to worship because we have a Savior that is risen and he is alive and well today. So we are so glad that you're here. We're going to celebrate today. We're going to worship through song. We're going to have a wonderful message in just a few moments. 
And again, we're so glad that you're here with us. So would you stand with me again as we continue to worship this morning? Let's pray together and ask God just to fill this place and to fill our hearts today. God, we thank you today for this wonderful day of celebration. God, we thank you this morning that we can gather together because we worship a Savior, that that tomb is empty today. And God, we thank you for that love that you have for us and that you made the ultimate sacrifice for us so that our relationship with you could be restored. God, I pray today that, that we would feel the presence in a powerful way of you, our Lord and Savior. God, let your spirit fill this room this morning. But more importantly, God, let your spirit today just fill our hearts and our lives. God, I don't know uh, where each person comes in here today with. I don't know what they've struggled with over the last year, but God, you do. And God, I pray that today would just be a day of encouragement for all of us. It would be a day of renewal for all of us. God, I pray that this morning our hearts would be so open to you that we would receive whatever it is that you have for us. God, I pray that your word today would just pierce our hearts and God, we know that your word will accomplish what you have set forth for it to accomplish. And we look forward to what you're going to do through your word today. Now, God, I pray that our worship this morning would be pleasing to your ears. And God, that we would just be drawn into your presence today. Again, we thank you for all that you do for us. We thank you for your wonderful love for us that we do not deserve. But God, you freely give. And we love you today because you first loved us. And it's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. I was buried beneath my shame. Who could care? that sing us with me need to rescue my sin was heavy the chains break at the weight of your glory i needed shelter i was an orphan you 
We just want to thank you for sitting in your side of the cross for us. That he rose from the dead. The head that once was crowned in thorns is crowned in glory now. The Savior knelt to wash our feet.
soldiers watched in vain was borrowed for three days his body there would not remain our God has robbed the
Let me tell you about this uh, gentleman that we're going to baptize today. His name is Boss Van Altena, and Boss moved here from Holland in 2007 and uh, lived out in the Chicago area. They moved to Canyon in about 2017, and they started attending the church. I'm not sure exactly what year it was that we baptized his daughter Lily, but I think it was a couple years ago, close to that. And I remember when we were visiting and talking about baptism, Lily was just really concerned about Dad because he had not yet been baptized. And I, and I have to respect boss's position because he said, I don't want to do it for somebody else. I don't want to do it just because my family wants me to do it. I want to know that it's, it's what I need to do. And when the time is right, I'll be ready and um, I'll be ready to get baptized. And so I've I just been praying for boss for two years. Um, ever since that day, Lily, I've been praying for your dad and, and just, God, would you just show him that today's the day, today's the day. Well, Monday, um, after church last Sunday, I got a text from boss. He's a truck driver. He's on the road, and we have a lot of conversations when he's on the road. And um, He texted me. He says, I want to be baptized. I'm ready. And, of course, I'm almost crying at that point, and I'm like, yeah, right now, let's do it. And I said, I tell you what, do you want to get baptized on Easter? And I love his heart because he's like, man, I don't want to hijack Easter. That's like Jesus' big day. And I'm like, can you imagine what greater illustration there is than the death and the burial and the resurrection of Christ Jesus that we see in baptism? Amen? So this time, go ahead and get the order. Thanks, that way. And so I, I'm super excited today to get to baptize Boss. His real name's Hendrick, but <clears throat> his friends call him Boss. And... Uh, He's fun to talk to because he's still got that accent, and it's, uh, sometimes I have to go, huh? What did you say? The boss, I, I mean, I love you, and I'm super happy for you this day, and I know your family is as well, as well as your church family. And it's a big thing that you're, you're doing today because you're publicly professing your faith in Christ. And so I'm going to ask you, like I asked you in my office the other day, have you placed your faith in Jesus? Yes. All right, and are you wanting to follow him today as a disciple? Yes. Okay. Well, because of your public profession of faith in him and obedience to the command of our Lord and Savior, Jesus, I baptize you, my brother, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Buried with him in his death. Raised to walk with him in a new life. Get it? Sorry.
Hit her. Zurich. But very early on Sunday morning, the women went to the tomb, taking the spices they had prepared. They found that the stone had been rolled away from the entrance. So they went in, but they didn't find the body of the Lord Jesus. As they stood there puzzled, two men suddenly appeared to them, clothed in dazzling robes. The women were terrified and bowed with their faces to the ground. Then the men said, why are you looking among the dead for someone who is alive? He isn't here. He is risen from the dead. Remember what he told you back in Galilee, that the Son of Man must be betrayed into the hands of sinful man and be crucified, and that he would rise again on the third day. They then remembered that he had said this, so they rushed back from the tomb to tell his 11 disciples and everyone else what had happened. It was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James, and several other women who told the apostles what had happened. But the story sounded like nonsense to the men. That's typically the, the case. So they didn't believe it. However, Peter jumped up and he ran to the tomb to look. Stooping, he peered in and saw the empty linen wrappings. Then he went home again, wondering what had happened. He is risen. I don't know about you, but I am so happy to be here today. I'm happy to be able to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus corporately together with actually warm bodies in the room. This time last year, it was a little different. Uh, I remember pre-recording the Easter message, and uh, by the time that thing aired on Sunday, or we were watching it in our TVs, this building was empty. And I just remember going home and watching it on TV with the family, celebrating Easter, and it just felt empty to me. I felt like, man, there's something missing. It just didn't feel the same as it usually feels. And I just felt like I had this void in me. And I know what it was. It was I was missing the people. Because I believe this uh, celebration of the resurrection of Christ is to be celebrated together corporately. Amen? And, and so you think about it, last year was just, a, there was a whole lot of emptiness in last year. We had empty churches, we had empty restaurants, we had empty malls, empty, oh man, stores, empty movie theaters, just a lot of uh, emptiness around us. <clears throat> Maybe you felt the same way, man, nowhere to go, nobody to see. And to add to all of that stress, it was pretty stressful, that season of emptiness. There was uh, the effects of a pandemic. For some people, they lost some income. A lot of businesses lost income due to the pandemic. Some even lost their jobs. And what's always difficult, especially in that past season, was during the, the pandemic when we had this separation thing. And those who had loved ones um, in the long-term uh, long, long care facilities, they weren't able to see them. I remember pictures on the internet of a husband looking through a window uh, to his wife was in this care facility. And it just breaks your heart to see people go through that. There was a sense of emptiness there. Or a loved one was in a hospital and we weren't able to be there with them. Or even worse, you lost a loved one. And you know all too well what that sense of emptiness might feel like. The fact is that we live in a world that makes a lot of empty promises, doesn't it? And now we had a lot of opportunities to watch TV during the pandemic, and we saw a lot of advertisements. And those advertisements will tell us stuff like, you can be sexy, you can be healthy, you can be successful, famous, if you just buy my product, right? And we know all too well that those promises are just filled with Emptiness, And what emptiness does is it just kind of brings discouragement, disappointment, anxiety, fear, and all of those negative emotions. But that's why I have good news today. The good news is God is different. And while the world may offer a lot of promises that are empty, God in Easter offers us the emptiness that's full of promise. And let me explain that. We celebrate today the empty tomb. It's the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's the death, the burial, and the resurrection of him. In fact, I believe that God's answer for the world's emptiness is in the Easter story. God's answer for our emptiness is the gospel of Jesus Christ. And it's filled with all kinds of hope and promise. And church, you just need to know this, that this hope and promise is not just for one day a year. 
It, it is the, a living in the hope of Easter. It's a lifestyle, living every day with the hope that we are shown in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Are you glad for Easter? Are you grateful for the resurrection of Christ? So, as I said, Easter is God's answer to an empty life. And I want to share with you today as we consider the Easter story. We usually focus on the empty tomb, but I want to share with you three things in the Easter story that are empty. Usually the word empty is, is negative. Empty gas tank, empty stomach, empty bank account, right? Empty heart. But in the case of Easter, empty is awesome. Because it's in this story of emptiness that we see these promises that God gives to us and always has given to us, and they're just as real today as they were even back then. And so I want you to consider as they were going to the tomb, it says early on Sunday morning, the women went to the tomb. So just imagine for a moment that you're with those ladies and you're going to the tomb because your teacher, your Messiah, your friend, someone you loved very dearly was in that tomb. So it says early on Sunday morning, they went to the tomb. And the first thing I want you to know that was empty, uh, that, that I believe holds a great promise, is not when they get to the tomb, but it's before they get there, and it's the empty cross. Now before you say, Shane, the cross is not mentioned in the resurrection story. Well, in the Gospel of John, it is. It says that um, Christ, uh, let, let me find it real quick. It says that the place where the crucifixion was was near a garden. And in that garden, there was a tomb that no one had ever laid in before. And so uh, Joseph of Arimathea asked for the body of Jesus. And he, along with Nicodemus, took Jesus and put him in this tomb that was very near to the crucifixion site. So as the women were on their way to the tomb that morning, I want you to know, while it was still early, it might have been dark, but burned in their memory was the, the, the visual image of what they saw just a couple of days ago at that place of crucifixion. The locals would call it the place of the skull, Golgotha. We call it the hill, that, that, that Calvary, on Calvary's hill where Christ paid the price for all humanity. But, but on that hill was three crosses. The reason they're still there is because the Sabbath had come and, and it was now over and they had not had the chance to take the crosses down yet. And so there, maybe in their vision, we don't know, it was early in the morning, maybe it was light enough that they could see that reminder of Friday and they saw those crosses. And I want you to look at those crosses too. No, not that one, the one in the middle. The cross in the middle where Jesus was crucified. And on that cross, it's stained with the blood of Jesus. You know, the blood from the crown of thorns that he wore on his head. The blood that came from his back when it says they took the cat of nine tails and they whipped him across the back. And it was not just a little whipping. It was designed to inflict as much torture and pain as possible. And there was blood on his back. The blood from his hands and his feet when he was crucified to the cross. And ultimately, the blood that stained the cross and the ground beneath it when the Roman soldier took the spear and stabbed Jesus in the side to ensure that he was, in fact, dead. Don't let anyone ever tell you that Jesus wasn't dead. There are some that believe in a swoon theory that Jesus simply fainted or passed out from all of the, the abuse and the exhaustion. But everyone there knew that Jesus was dead. The Roman soldier knew that he was dead. The Jews knew that he was dead. And his disciples knew that he was dead on that cross on Calvary. But there's something else that I want you to see about that cross. As I said, there's emptiness throughout the resurrection story. That cross is empty. Why is it empty? Because Jesus died. And what did that accomplish? Well, if you were here last week, we, we hit on that. <clears throat> what Jesus accomplished, his mission was to come and to seek and to save that which was lost. And Jesus came to this earth. He, he lived a sinless life. And he took up on him the sins of the entire world. And he died on a cross to pay for your sins and my sins. There, there's a word in scripture and theolo theology that we call propitiation. And propitiation simply means the act of gaining or regaining the favor or goodwill of someone or something. It's to make restitution. It's to make a payment or to make amends. And so what you and I need to know is that we, the Bible says in Romans 3, that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. There's no one righteous, not one person. And he goes on to say that the wages of sin is death, and without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. And so Jesus came and he went to the cross and in our place he died. His blood was shed for the forgiveness of sins and that sacrifice was satisfactory to God the Father. It was a propitiation, a payment, making amends, regaining the favor 
between God and man. In fact, Isaiah 52 says it this way, but many were amazed when they saw him. His face was so disfigured he seemed hardly human. And from his appearance, one would scarcely know he was a man. Why did he do it? He did it to make us right with God. Amen? Romans 5 eight says, But God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. And since we have been made right in God's sight by the blood of Christ, he will certainly save us from God's condemnation. 1 Peter 2.24 says, He personally carried our sins in his body on the cross so that we can be dead to sin and live for what is right. By his wounds, we are healed. My friends, the cross, the empty cross in the Easter story presents to us a promise of God. That empty cross reminds us that sins are forgiven. Sin is atoned for. You know, we see a lot of crosses. We have one hanging here. You'll see people with them around their neck. or Maybe they have a tattoo. But I just want to remind you, every time you see a cross, just remember that that cross was God's means of forgiving the sin debt of the whole entire world. That's good news, isn't it? God's promise that sins are forgiven. <clears throat> There's a, a second thing that I want to point out. It's the one that we usually focus on, and it's the tomb. So it says that the ladies, early on Sunday morning, they were headed to the tomb. And, of course, they get there, and Jesus is, is not there. Naturally, they're wondering, who took him? Where did Jesus go? But I want to back up and think about a tomb for a moment. What is that? The tomb is the place of the dead. It's the place where life ends, right here. It's, we don't go further beyond the tomb. Now, we don't understand tombs in our culture today, but we do graves and for a lot of people, they see the grave as the end of a life. It's, it's, it's when we come to the, the end of that, that connection, that fellowship that we once had with a loved one. And, and it's a, just a harsh reality that life is so vulnerable. And we're not guaranteed uh, that we'll be here long. And so the tomb was a place that was um, where their Savior was held, where Jesus was held. And, and they were going there to prepare him for death. But there's something else about that tomb that we need to know and that we always celebrate every Easter is the tomb is empty. Aren't you glad the tomb's empty? The tomb is empty. Now, I used to stop there and say, man, that's it. That's the, that's the, the nail on the head. That's all they needed to know. But the tomb was empty, and for us, we need to know that Jesus conquered death. So when the tomb was empty, death was defeated. And for you and me, we need to realize that There's always the hope of life after death. There's always a hope that death is not the end, that death has been defeated. Jesus took the sting of death. Where, oh, death is your victory. Where, oh, death is your sting. Heard a little story about a father and a son that were driving along in a car, and a little bee got inside the car with them, and the the little boy who was deathly allergic to, to bees was panicking, and his dad looked at his face, and he was worried about him, and so the dad just reaches up and grabs the bee in his hand. A couple minutes later, he opens it up and lets the bee fly away again. And, of course, the young man starts to panic again. And the dad looks at the son and said, he showed him his hand. And he says, don't worry, son, I took the sting for you. What you and I need to know is when Jesus died on the cross, was buried in the tomb, and he was no longer in that tomb, that empty tomb, to us is a beautiful promise that there's life after death and the sting of death. God says, I've removed the sting of death for you. We don't have to fear death. Amen? In fact, you know that we demonstrate that promise Every time we lay a loved one to rest. If you notice, every time you go to a cemetery, there's a traditional or a custom that where you put the body in the ground with her head to the west. You know why we do that? We do that because we believe that Jesus is going to return from the east. And so the idea is at the resurrection that everyone who is dead and in the grave, when they rise up, they'll be facing the east where they'll see Jesus when he comes. How cool is that, right? So every time we lay a loved one to rest, we demonstrate our, our faith and our hope in life after death. I always panic if we accidentally get them in there backwards and I think they're going to raise up at the resurrection and go, where's Jesus? But God's promise of an empty tomb is that there is life after death and we don't have to be fearful of death. We're promised eternal life. 1 Corinthians, if you want to turn there with me, David read some of that earlier, but I want to read verse 20. As David said, if there's no resurrection of the dead and Christ has not been raised either, 
then our preaching is useless and your faith is useless. Everything we're doing is in vain. In verse 20, it says, but in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, first of a great harvest who have died. A great harvest. What does that mean? So you see, just as death came into the world through a man, now the resurrection from dead has become through another man. Just as everyone dies because we all belong to Adam, everyone who belongs to Christ will be given new life. But there is an order to this resurrection. Christ was raised as the first of the harvest. Then all who belong to Christ will be raised when he comes back. I don't know about you, but I get stoked when I think about the promise that there's life beyond the grave. I mean, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Paul said it, um, to live is Christ, to die is gain. Why? Because we believe in the resurrection. Do you hope today in the resurrection? It's a beautiful promise that he gives us, and we see it every time we attend a funeral. In fact, I, I want to remind you every time you see that grave, just realize that for those who place faith in Christ, uh, that's not the end. In fact, I'd say it's not the end for anybody. But there's a great hope that lies beyond the grave of our loved ones when we lay them to rest in faith that we will see them again and there is a hope of eternal life. Empty cross, sins forgiven. Empty tomb, death is defeated. Hope of eternal life. And back to the Gospel of John, his account of this. The third thing, it was empty there that I, I always overlook this. I mean, I've heard people talk about it before, but I like this when it's the empty burial clothes. So when they left Jesus in the tomb, they had wrapped him in linens. This is Joseph of Arimathea and, and Nicodemus brought about 75 pounds of, of ointments and, and spices, and they prepared Jesus for burial. And they were waiting for the Sabbath to be over so that they could go back and finish the process. And so that was their preparation for Jesus' uh, final resting place. And so when they returned to the tomb, they were headed to the tomb, and they said, who's going to roll the stone away because it's huge? We're not going to be able to do it. But then they said there was an earthquake, and, and then there was an angel sitting on the stone. And he says, why do you look for the living among the dead? The, the, the tomb was empty, and as they, they walk in, in fact, I like the way it says with John, it says the one that Jesus loved, John, he took off running to the tomb with Peter, and he outran Peter. I, I, I always like that they throw that little detail in there. It says, they were both running, uh, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He stooped and he looked in, and he saw the linens wrapped, or the linen wrappings lying there, but he didn't go in. I was thinking, Jewish tradition, that would be unclean to, to touch or desecrate a grave. It would be a dishonorable thing, so maybe John was just stopping because he's thinking, this is a as a holy thing, and I don't want to disrupt this grave, but not, not Simon Peter. Simon's always been kind of the guy to just speak first and then think about it later, or act first. And so Simon comes from behind, and he went on inside. It says, he also noticed the linen wrappings lying there, while the cloth that had covered Jesus' head was folded up and lying apart from the other wrappings. Now, there's a, a thing going around a few years back talking about the, the folded napkin and what that means, and, and there's no... Uh, there's no evidence of that in all the Jewish teachings. It's a, it's a beautiful thought, but the idea is one of a servant and a master, and as long as he was still eating at the table, he would leave his napkin uh, messy, but when he was through eating, he would fold the nap napkin to ensure to the servant that he would be back. I mean, I love that. That story, that's great, but you can't find it in any of the Jewish teaching. But the word in the Greek for folded is the same one that we use for wrappings. And so if you imagine Jesus is wrapped in these cloth linens, and then on the resurrection, he came through out of those cloth linings, and, and those wrappings that were around his head just simply came to a resting place, folded down and wrapped. And John takes care to, uh, to make sure we know that it was separate from the other linens that Jesus was wrapped in. And this is what I like, verse um, 8, it says, Then the disciple who had reached the tomb first also went, and he saw, what? The empty burial clothes. He saw and he believed. He didn't believe when he saw the empty tomb. In fact, there was a lot of people that were, and the ladies were saying, where have you taken the body of Jesus? Tell us where you put him so that we can go get him, right? 
In fact, there was a, a concern that the disciples would come and steal away the body of Jesus. And so you remember the Romans go to the leading priests and the, and the leaders there. And they said, hey, let's post some guards around the tomb. Because what's going to happen is somebody's going to steal the body of Jesus in the middle of the night. And they're going to tell everybody that he's risen from the dead. And we'll have to deal with that mess. So let's put some, some guards at the tomb. Of course, you know the story. The earthquake, the, the guards fell in a dead faint. The stone was rolled away. And I just tell you this, the stone was not rolled away so that Jesus couldn't get, that he could get out of the tomb. The stone was rolled away so that they could see in that he was no longer there. The empty cross, the empty tomb, these empty burial clothes. And it was at this moment John saw the empty, the empty burial clothes and he believed. You know what that meant for them? This Jesus that they had hung out with that was gone on Friday was now making his return. And their fellowship with him would, would soon be restored. David mentioned that in that passage a while ago. He showed himself to, to Peter and to the disciples, to the ladies, and to the 500 people at one time. He would soon restore the fellowship. He would be able to talk with them. He would say to Thomas, hey, touch my hand and my sides because you don't believe. Touch it and so you'll know that I'm really not a ghost and I'm real in the flesh. Believe. He approached the disciples and said, do you all have anything to eat? And he would eat with the disciples. And, and so to them, that must have been a huge deal, right? This Jesus that they loved so dearly that was crucified on Friday was now back. Their fellowship was restored and they could have a relationship with him once again. That's good news too, right? So when we consider the empty burial cloth, let it be a reminder of God's promise of relationship. His promise of Resurrection. Jesus is alive, and he's still alive today, church. That's what we celebrate. We, in fact, we celebrate every Sunday the resurrection of Jesus, right? He's alive, and that means everything to us. And so I would say this, for those of us who go through life and we feel uh, at, at times empty, there's this emptiness in us. There's a lot of hope in the Easter story. I just want to remind us today that that hope that our sins are forgiven that should be enough to put a smile on our face when we realize how sinful we are and how holy our God is to know that the tomb is empty that I don't have to fear death that sting of death has been removed to know that one day when my life on this earth is over I can go confidently before the one that made it all possible to be absent from this body is to be present with the Lord I look forward to the day in fact someone said this morning you know I always hoped Jesus would return on Easter I'm like come right now I won't have to preach It'd be awesome, right? In, a, in an instant, we're in the presence of the choir singing, holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. I mean, I'm ready. The empty tomb, the promise of eternal life is so precious to me, and I hope it is to you as well. The empty burial cloths, a reminder of us of a personal relationship with God. You know that what Jesus did for us on Calvary um, was like a bridge that he built between God and us. It was like he introduced us to the Father. He put us in right standing before God. He says that we've been made righteous by the blood of Christ. We've been justified by what Jesus did. And to know that the relationship that he wants to have with each and every one of us, he still wants to have. He's just as real today as he was when he was originally raised from the grave on that resurrection Sunday and he is alive today listen think about it like this the cross couldn't hold him the tomb couldn't contain him and the burial cloths were unnecessary because Jesus is alive he has skin and bones and a face that's recognizable he talked he touched he loved he healed he did all that on the day of his resurrection and he still does it today most importantly, he wants to do that with you and me as well. So I'll ask you this question, and I believe it's a very important question. Do you know Jesus? I'm not saying do you know him like um, I know Donald Trump, all right? I know who he is, but I can't say that I know. I'm not sitting in an office and visited with him, right? Or one of your favorite music singers, like do you know? Oh, yeah, I know them, but you don't really know them. Do you know about Jesus or do you? Do you know him? Have you placed your faith in him? Have you trusted in him for salvation? Maybe you're here today and you're saying, Shane, I, there just seems like there's in my life there's something that's just missing. It's, it's empty. And if you've not placed your faith in Christ, listen, I know what that is. I've been there. Many people have been there. Why? 
Because the Bible says that God has placed eternity in the hearts of man. You know what that means? I've heard it put this way. There's like a God-sized hole in everyone's heart, and we try to fill it with all these different things, right? We're like, if I just get married, then I'll be happy. And, and it's temporary fulfillment, right? And then you realize, ah, that's not it. Well, if I can just make money or get a job and, you know, go to school and get this degree, and, and we try to fill it with all these different things, and we find out that everything just comes up empty, The good news of the gospel is the only thing that's going to plug that hole is the gospel of Jesus Christ, believing in the story of Easter, the death and the burial and resurrection of Christ. In fact, I remember years ago, Eddie Murphy, comedian, had gained it all. He was very rich, very successful, and he said, I just feel like my life is empty. I feel like there's something missing. And I'm like, duh, I know what it is. And the good news is, with those promises, those empty promises, Uh, That emptiness that gives us the promises of God, there's another promise that says in Romans 10, 13, for everyone, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. What another beautiful promise, right? So if you're here today and you say, hey, Shane, I I feel empty. I got good news for you. God's answer to your emptiness is the gospel. And as a believer, you say, Shane, I just, it's been a hard year. It's been difficult for me. There's been a lot of things that I've experienced in that emptiness. Just be reminded of his promises, and his promises are yes and amen. His promises are true. His promises never fade. Amen. When we see the cross, we know that our sins are forgiven, and that is so refreshing to me to know that I stand before him, not because of my own works, but because of what Christ did on the cross, forgiven through the cross. The tomb being empty reminds me, once again, of my hope of eternal life and no fear of death. And those empty burial clothes remind me and should remind us also of this personal, personal relationship with Jesus Christ. How sweet it is. I heard someone say one time, I believe you can be as close to God as you want to be. The word says, draw near to him and he'll draw near to you. And I just want to encourage you in this time, in this story of Easter, to be encouraged. To not let the things that are going on in the world that we already know in this world you'll have troubles. But Jesus says, take heart, I've overcome the world. There's good news for those who place their faith in Christ. Amen. Our emptiness is answered with God's promises, and it's all centered in the gospel. And like I said, and David said earlier, if there's no resurrection, we have no hope, but he is risen. He is risen. He is risen indeed. And because he lives, we have that hope that sustains us. Amen. Isn't that beautiful? Beautiful. I hope that you're encouraged this Easter season. And I would say if you're here and you've not placed your faith in Christ, you say, Shane, I, I really need to talk to somebody. I would like to visit with you after church. When we dismiss in a moment, I'm going to pray. And when we dismiss, I would encourage you to come forward. David and I would be happy to meet with you and to visit with you for a moment. And maybe you're like, man, Shane, there's just too many people here, and, and I don't want to do that. As David mentioned earlier, take one of the cards um, from the visitor card there and mark on there. I'm interested in talking to somebody about salvation. And we would love to be able to reach out to you. But as I say all the time, and I don't get tired of saying it, and I'll never get tired of saying it, the most important thing that we can do in this life is place our faith in the gospel of Jesus Christ. More important than where we'll live, what jobs we'll have, right, how much money we'll have, the most important thing is what do you do with Jesus? I hope that everyone in the room has placed their faith in him today. Amen? And we celebrate the resurrection of our Lord and Savior. Father, I thank you for the gospel. I thank you for the story of Easter. Lord, I thank you that even in the emptiness of Easter, those symbols that are there that were all three empty and how they just remind us of your love for us. They remind us of, Lord, the promises that are still true today for us, that our sins can be forgiven. Lord, and and we just admit our sin to you. We repent of those sins, turn away from and turn toward you. Lord, we believe in the gospel, the death and the burial and the resurrection of Christ. And confess you as Lord. Lord, I want you to be my Lord and my Savior. I I just thank you for the hope that our sins are forgiven because of that empty cross as a reminder. And I thank you for the hope, Lord, that we can have eternal life when we place our faith in you. That we don't have to be fearful of death. That that sting of death has been removed by you. And now we, we know, Lord, that to be absent from this body one day is to be present with you. Not only for us, but our loved ones as well. And Lord, just that sweet part of knowing that the the resurrection, you being alive and you leaving those grave clothes behind, I can imagine 
how that just put to death any rumors of a stolen body because they wouldn't have stolen a body without the cloths on him, but those being left behind was the proof that John saw and he believed. And Lord, I I thank you for that reminder for us today that you are alive and you are a real Jesus and you're here with us now and you want a relationship with each and every one of us. And Father, I pray that we would... uh, answer your invitation Lord as you knock on our heart's door and we would respond to that and Lord that also we would live our lives on this earth even as believers as we walk out of these doors today live our lives with the confidence Lord that uh, we have because of the promises that you give us uh, Lord in the in the resurrection story Lord as always it's all about you we give you all the praise and all the glory and all the honor Lord you just encourage your people today Lord, we celebrate the resurrection of our Lord and Savior. Be glorified this day. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.